Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Edge 2014. Brought to you by IBM. Hi, everybody. We're back at IBM Edge. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick, and we're here in Las Vegas at the Sands Convention Center. We're going two days. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. Pamela Gilman is here. She's the manager of data analysis for the services group at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We're going to geek out on uh, <laughs> HPC and big data. Pamela, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It's great very to welcome. see you. So tell us a little bit about um, NCAR and your role there and what you guys got going on. Okay, so the National Center for Atmospheric Research is the, the national center that we have the, the uh, facilities that we provide services to atmospheric researchers. It's uh, run by a university corporation. So I believe at this point we have 95 member universities that uh, define kind of the, world, the work that we do. Our focus is mainly on climate as uh, opposed to weather. So most people don't understand the difference there. Weather is what you listen to your forecast at the evening. Where it's short term, you want to know what it's going to do tomorrow. Can I go to the pool today or not? Right. Climate is a very long term uh, research. So some of our researchers run uh, models that they're looking at what happened in the weather over a thousand year time period. And so they're looking for the cyclic things, they're looking for the correlations from year to year and through time. And so what the National Center for Atmospheric Research does is provide the resources to allow that type of research to occur. And you're an independent agency, is that right? Or, we or? are federally funded, but we're managed, uh, UCAR is the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, which is the consortium of universities, and that's our governing body. So what's happening with climate? Uh, that was, thank you for describing <laughs> that, climate versus weather, and it's, a, it's something we see all, you know, all the time. You see the, the left and the right is arguing about right. it. What's, what's, the, what's the facts? What's really happening with so climate? So the facts are a little difficult to, to find sometimes. Science is, especially with something that you can't produce an experiment and then say, okay, I've proven it, I've done it three times and I get the same answer. Climate is a little more difficult than that. So some of our researchers, one of the groups that I work with that I love to work with does paleo era climate. So they've actually gone back and they're running that thousand years across the paleolithic era, looking at the data from, you can pull core samples and see what actually occurred. And so they're looking to see, um, do the models that we run to look at things in the future were they able to show you what actually happened in that time period? So they're trying to look at, at what they think can occur and what's happening. And of course, depending on how you run it, you can get different answers. Um, I believe that at this point, there, you know, the majority of scientists believe that we're in a, in a period of change. Things are changing rapidly. We've got, if you look at the, the news any day today, you see you know, the, the ice sheets are melting. And then you have where you get a warmer day one day and a colder day the other. So yes. mostly this is trying to figure out why is the change occurring? Is this the normal change? And uh, coming to some consensus as to what's happening. Well, I, I saw Mount St. Helens blow up about uh, 30 years yeah. ago approximately. And that, you know, when Mother Nature uh, decides to do something or rip Africa from South America, it's pretty significant. Yeah, My question on, on what you guys do, is it the data? Is it the data sets? Is it the computing horsepower? Is it the models when you say you provide solutions for mm -hmm. people to test things to the universities? What exactly do you guys provide and where do you get that? So we do um, a little bit of all of it actually. So um, we have, the from the scientific standpoint, EDCAR is built of multiple labs and there's five or six labs and all but one of those labs do the science. And so there, there are two groups that I work with closely that do the models that are, one is the producing that paleolithic and the future climate data. Another one is one that does a weather model that does the hurricane forecasting, and we work with that. So we have the scientists there that are generating these models that they run. The lab that I work in is the Computational Information Sciences Lab. We actually produce the resources and we manage those resources. So we have a very large supercomputer center. It's about 25,000 square feet today. We've got the double capacity that all we have to do is put machinery in it to do that. And that's where our flagship systems live today. That current system is an big eye dataplex system and that's where all of the storage systems, we have a, a large tape archive, so everything from spinning storage into tape that supports that supercomputer. And then the university will lease out 
they actually just ask through the allocation. There's an allocation process, okay. and we have a panel that decides. So they'll say, this is the science I want to do. This is kind of the research that I'm trying to look at, and can I have time on the computer? And what are your data sources? Where's all this data come from? So a lot, most of the data is produced either on our computer, in, in our center, or at some of the other national centers. There's uh, several centers that have the large systems. And then we'll bring that data back. And so one of the focuses that my group works on is some of those data transfer protocols to the spinning storage is so that when you produce data elsewhere that we want to have at NCAR that we can get that there effectively and efficiently. How much data are we talking about here? So currently what we have um, in the facility is about 33 petabytes in our tape archive. We have about 18 petabytes of spinning storage that's available and that's it, you know, anywhere from 60 to 90% used at any given time. Okay, and, and any flash in there? Or? We don't have any flash today. That's actually a technology that we're very interested in moving forward. What do you envision using flash for? Just sort of metadata or So we've analysis looked at or? metadata in the past. Right now, it's more efficient for us to keep the metadata in the spinning storage with, oh. the, with the data itself. Um, I think the thing that we're looking at, we've got a, a next generation machine in the next couple of years, is looking at the flash uh, as kind of that bu the burst buffer, the, the terminology that everybody's starting to talk about now. Um, our models uh, do a lot of small file output, so they're, because they run through time, they'll run one time step and output data, run a time step output data. And so having that flash that's close to where they're producing the data that can handle that as they do these time steps and then allowing that to trickle out more to the spinning storage over time is something that we're, that we're very interested in, in looking at. So there's definitely a discussion, we talk about it all the time in theCUBE, with this whole you know, notion of high performance computing and big data coming together and actually finding commercial applications. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of the big data HPC, big data meets HPC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you seeing there? Uh, is it, you know, uh, where do analytics fit in? How does it affect architectures? Talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the projects that I've worked with and, and I think a lot of people have heard about is the IPCC runs, the International Panel for Climate Control. And they do these periodic runs every four to five years that um, produce, in, and it's an international panel. And so the first year that I worked with that was the IPCC4 run. And the total amount of data that we output from that run was 100 terabytes. That was not difficult to manage. I was able to give them a dedicated storage system. Um, that data, once it's produced, is made available to the community for about five years for anybody to come and get and, and download to do whatever research they're doing with. So we completed the IPCC5 run a couple of years ago, and NCAR can't even curate all of the data from that run. So we have about a petabyte to two petabytes of that data, and that's not even all of it from that run. So you can see the scale within a four year time frame of how much just the same thing you're trying to do could jump. And so that's a, that's a huge challenge. So we, we use some of the, um, we bring that data in, and then we have what we call science gateways that hosts that, and so that's a way of allowing the analytics to occur to allow the community to come in and say, I want um, the data from this run, but I only want, some of these things have like 100 variables in them, I only want the three variables I'm interested in. And so we've taken and coupled that, that functionality with our computational side so that the group that, that manages that data, they can pull that, use our computational resources to pull those variables out, package a data set, and, and deliver that to, to the customer that's asked for that. So you're, you're, you're obviously a GPFS user. Yes. Right? And I seen, have been for a very long time, I was actually. Say, it's a <laughs> tried and true file system. You, yeah. You're seeing it now seep in, I talked about commercial applications, you're mm -hmm. seeing it seep into sort of IBM software-defined storage. Um, what other changes can we expect in, in because there's so much data now, uh, so much demand for real time, Mm -hmm. um, huge costs associated with all this stuff. What architectural changes should we expect coming down the, the pike in the next four to seven years? Ah, four to seven years. Everything will change <laughs> in forever. seven years. <laughs> the challenge is figuring out how you can change with yeah. it, I think. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, one of the things that, that we've already done is um, we used to have what I always referred to as islands, and we, we've talked about that in the past of being a very data-centric way of looking at things versus a, a resource-centric way. And so in the past, you had the supercomputer guys did their thing. They produced a lot of data. Their, their job was to have a, a fast machine and be able to put out data as quickly as possible. And then it was somebody else's problem. 
And that data moved around and from resource to resource for each of those tasks. Um, the thing that we did with the data center that we have now is we pulled all those resources into a central, central pool. So what we're trying to do is, is shift to where as the data is produced, somebody can look at it. And they don't have to move it. It's all right there, it can live in one home and they can get that complete task done. That's what we've referred to in some of our talks lately as an information-centric model mm -hmm. of trying to get the user to move what they're doing to where the data is because it's, we can't move the data any longer. So what I want to see in the future is a, is a more tight or coupling of that and hopefully analytics that can occur during computation. Right now it's still a very separate step. You do the compute and it's still different groups of people, right? They do, they produce that and then somebody else looks at it. Is I'd really like to see if we can provide an architecture where that can all happen you know, in stream. I think the flash plays into that is if we can keep some of that in memory and they can do post-processing or analysis, work on it while it's still there before it ever goes to spinning storage, then we can speed up that workflow. I mean, conceptually it sounds very Hadoop-like, right? Ship the, ship the code to the data, not the data to exactly. the code. Exactly. Uh, are you using Hadoop? Uh, no, we aren't using Hadoop. The okay. way that our codes are structured don't really work well with that at this point. Right. But we do have an effort underway right now to look at the codes and see if we can get the codes to shift somewhat to use some of those newer technologies. But conceptually, you're, you're, it's a similar philosophy. Yes, Ship very five much. megabytes of data to petabytes of uh, exactly. code to petabytes of data, not to, you know, exactly. the reverse. <laughs> um, and so it sounds like there's still a lot of batch act activity going on. Yes. And, uh, and you're trying to to make it more real time. I mean, I see, I see parallels with the yeah. whole Hadoop meme, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and big data and, and analytics. Yep. Our challenge is, is the climate codes are very, very large and they're, um, it's not one piece of code. It's actually like six pieces of code that have to talk together. So very fragmented. Very, and so it's the challenge right now with, those, with the, uh, the software developers with that is figuring out how to use some of the newer techniques. Um, one of my challenges is because I am a GPFS person is watching what they do bad to my file systems and to my, to my storage and, and trying to find the techniques, the coding techniques that I can pass on to them and say, here's a better way to do this. And you'll find that what you're trying to do is going to run more efficiently and faster if you bring in some of the parallel I.O. techniques that, that especially GPFS really likes. Mm -hmm. So Pamela, you talk about a lot of the data that you guys produce is, is produced by your models that are going out. Mm -hmm. What about on the inbound side? You know, the other kind of big trend that we talk a lot about on theCUBE is the Internet of Things and the industrial internet and you know, all these sensors that are out all over the mm -hmm. place. I would imagine in a climate control or a climate research um, world, that's a great opportunity to bring in lots of new data sets that maybe didn't have access before or not mm -hmm. as easily. Are you guys taking advantage of that? Is that kind of growing the input side of your processes or still not, not so significant? Um, to some extent, we, we are doing more what we would refer to as observational data. So there's instruments that go up in airplanes and collect data and we're bringing more of that in. That's really more of the weather side of things versus that climate side. So we're predominantly data that we produce but um, we are looking at, and like I was referred to earlier, the data transfer techniques and making sure we have the bandwidths and the, and the things that can handle that is uh, we're looking at, because the systems are expensive these days and having a system that's large enough to do the work we need to do means that we work in more locations than what we can afford. So that's becoming more and more uh, the, the challenge is to how do I bring a 10 terabyte data set or a 20 terabyte data set that I produced at another site back because it's the researchers where we are that need that data. You know, in the commercial world, Pamela, the, the focus of the storage people is really, you know, don't lose the data, don't touch my sand or I'll kill you, <laughs> right? Um, you know, make, make performance consistent. Yes. Doesn't have to be the best. Yes. Um, but don't lose the data. How do your requirements differ from the commercial world? So we, we very much have a don't lose the data and we've just been through an incident where it was please don't lose the data. Um, we do push performance and so it is a real challenge for my team is how do I get the maximum performance because then I, that's where my money has gone. So where do, how do I get that maximum and still have the stability? Um, one of the things that I absolutely love about GPFS is that you can push the performance and remain stable. And it's been one of the things, I, we've used that software for 15 years at least at this point, and so it's been a real highlight. Um, we do not back up a lot of our data, so unlike the commercial world where the center itself is taking that responsibility, dual copies, three copies, you know, tape, our tape archive is there for our users to use, and it's their responsibility to do that. 
Um, a lot of the data could be reproduced, which I think is different than a business world is right. because it's model data, you could rerun the model and produce it. That's expensive to do. So it's that balancing act of how much do we uh, allow tape archives so that if it's really critical, they can have it, or do we just say, maybe it's more you know, efficient for you to reproduce it. So we're seeing some of the, 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 the tenets of high performance computing seep into the enterprise, certainly scale out, mm -hmm. uh, low cost, you guys have used commodity components for, for years and years and years. Certainly we're seeing GPFS. How do you back up a petabyte? You don't. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of learnings here. <laughs> right. yeah. Pamela, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It was really a pleasure having you and good luck with the project. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, keep it, right, uh, keep it right there everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest. We're live from Las Vegas. We're at IBM Edge and this is theCUBE. We'll be right back.